Hi, everyone. Welcome to Dean's Chat, where we discuss all things podiatric medicine. My name is Dr. Jeffrey Jensen, Dean of the Arizona College of Podiatric Medicine and host of the Dean's Chat podcast. In my quest to bring you leaders in our great profession, my guest today has been a prolific researcher, author, educator, and lecturer for the past 45 years, and he is the world authority on the charcoal foot, as evidenced by his textbook. Welcome to Dean's Chat, Dr. Freiberg. Thank you, Dr. Jensen. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm excited to have you here, Bob. I've been hoping we'd get together for some time now. On Dean's Chat, we kind of have a fireside chat theme, so we go by first names. So Bob and Jeff, how's yeah, that sound? That's fine. All right. So, you know, instead of reading your extensive bio, I thought we would touch on your career highlights throughout the interview. And the first thing I wanted to ask you is, how do you go from being a zoology undergraduate major at University of Rhode Island to a student at the California College of Podiatric Medicine? I ask myself that every day. <laughs> uh, well, I was always interested in sciences. <laughs> here's, here's the funny thing. I picked the sciences in college because I didn't want to have to write papers. I always said, give me a test to study for, and I'll study for it and take the test. And then um, I, I say that because we move through my career, you see that I've done a lot of writing, which, which most people don't do. So I, I find that ironic. But, I, I was going to say, oh, the irony. But, but to your, to your point, uh, my mother was a nurse. I grew up... Uh, around medicine, I, I think, and uh, I was going to be a o an oceanographer. University of Rhode Island has a big oceanography program. Until I found out that it's very difficult to get into that program if you're an undergraduate at University of Rhode Island. So I started looking around. I said, "Well, if I'm going to do four years. I might as well make something of it." So I was going to become a doctor, and I knew through my mother, who was a charge nurse at a local hospital, a very, very uh, well-known podiatrist in, in, in New Jersey. His name was Ray Locke. I don't know if you ever knew him. But he very much impressed me. And also my best friend in high school, his uncle, was a very successful podiatrist in Manhattan. And so they kind of mentored me along, and I applied to podiatry school. And... Uh, the funny thing is, you know, this was in the hippie generation. And I said, hey, I want to go to San Francisco, you know, go to Haight-Ashbury and go to school there and have a good time. The other thing was, in those days, medical school, podiatry school, it was a three-year accelerated program. So I said, I'm going to take advantage of this. And at that time, California was the only school that had the three-year program. So I was the first class of three-year uh, graduates. And I was well prepared for it. I mean, I was ready to get out once I, once, once I was done because it was, it was fairly rigorous. Uh, I mean, I don't think it was unduly hard. You just had to put in your time and your effort. So that's how I got from zoology at University of Rhode Island to California College of Podiatric Medicine in downtown San Francisco, which, which was really quite a trip. Yeah, I went to CCPM also. It was four of the best years of our life. Three. For, four for me. <laughs> we got summers off, at least a little bit of it. Yeah. So that's interesting. So did you do some shadowing? Did you, you know, go into the offices of Dr. Locke and, and this other oh, sure. podiatrist? And oh, sure. Yeah, I used to go in. You know, it's Ray Locke. I mean, I, I knew him through my, through my mother, and he, he, he impressed me very much. And, you know, he was, uh, he was an icon in his day. We're going back in the 60s and the 70s. Very, very well-respected guy. And um, he really interested me because he took a more academic approach. It wasn't just a technical approach. It was more academic. I could remember talking to him about, about salicylic acid and platelet degranulation and all this kind of thing. You know, and I was starting to learn all these interesting things. And he took an interest in me. And the funny thing is, with Ray Locke, he eventually moved to California and he came out while I was a student, and we were working with him so that he could get updated for his California licensing board. Oh. So that was the interesting, interesting thing that, uh, you know, our, our relationship uh, carried over. He's, lo he's long gone now. Um, but anyway, he was one of the prime movers in my life. That's great. That. You know, me mentorship is so crucial, and we've all had all have had mentors. Mm -hmm. And without mentors, you're not really taught how to be successful or how to carry yourself. That's right. 
So you did a three-year accelerated program at CCPM, and then you went all the way back across the country for a residency at, at Deaconess. Yeah. Um, in, in those days, believe it or not, uh, you know, a lot of graduates came out and there were no residency slots for them. Most of the slots were one year, some okay, some most not very good. There were preceptorships where you actually had to pay a doctor to get postgraduate training, which was very strange. Wow. But the Deaconess, New England Deaconess Hospital was unique because in those days, it was only one of a handful that had a 24-month program as opposed to 12 months. And it was a Harvard teaching hospital. And I had developed an interest in diabetic foot through my external rotations when I was a student, specifically at the hospital that I was born at in Hackensack Hospital, New Jersey. You know, I always say I'm from the South because I was born in South Hackensack, New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, that's how my career really moved because of the influences of that one rotation. And when I saw my first Charcot foot, that's where I saw it at Hackensack Hospital when I was a third year, third year student. And then the doctors there knew the director of my program up in Boston. And so they wrote a letter for me. And th this is an interesting story also. Uh, I, I don't know. What, I was top five in my class, I guess. I, I mean, I just was. I, I don't really know. But I was, I was a good student. Because I did the work. I mean, I studied. I, I had fun. But I studied every night, you know. I, I was down the stacks at uh, University of California, San Francisco, every night studying. And uh, I, did, I did the work. But uh, so I thought I'd get a program. I did not want to apply to the school's program because I was afraid I'd get it. And I didn't want to be stuck there because they had their own, their own residency program. So I picked uh, New England Deaconess Hospital, which I thought was probably the best one in the country at that time. I mean, all ac academically, maybe not the highest surgical volume, but it was the, the best one and the best hospital uh, and, and focused on diabetes. So I applied there and come match day, you know, your big excitement match day. I was not unmatched. Oh. I was unmatched. So then I said, wow, this is interesting. So I had to scramble, you know, where can I go? What can I get a job? Because in those days, you can get a license without having a residency. And I was scrambling. I was looking into the service. I don't, I forget exactly what I was doing. And then I got a call one morning from the residency director at the Deaconess Hospital, Jack Donovan. And he says, Bob, we, uh, sorry, you know, we had to pull out of the match because they pulled our funding in the hospital. But we fought and we got it back. And you were our first choice. Oh, my gosh. You are our first choice. Now, how do you explain that? Because if I would have gotten picked by another program, I would have had to have gone to the other program. Right. So I got my first choice, a little belated, after a lot of stress, after a, a month or so. And I got it. And it was a wonderful, wonderful program. And I was familiar with Boston. I mean, I used to hang out there when, you know. Uh, when, when I was going to URI, because it was just a, an hour or, or so up the road. So I was very familiar with Boston. It must have been your destiny to end up at well, I New guess, England I, I guess so. But, you know, it, it was good because I met really high quality people. You know, in podiatry in those days, you wouldn't know it, Jeff, but academics and scholarly activities was not part of our program. My professors, I remember just playing pinball in the student lounge all the time. That's what they did. Doctor of pinball machine was DPM. Hmm. Um, and there was no academics, you know, challenging who wrote this paper, who did that paper, or what kind of a paper you're going to do. Nothing. But when I got to the deaconess, I was, I was with world-class people. Some of the earliest uh, vascular surgeons in Boston, Frank Wheelock, uh, Carl Hoare, and these people were very, very well known for their, for their early vascular interventions. You know, some of the earliest uh, in situ uh, non-reverse veins were done at the Deaconess Hospital in Boston. They were doing, they were doing these operations five, five days a week. So I was in a new environment, and that pushed me forward to think, 
to higher levels. You know, don't just be a technician, you know, be a doctor, be a scholarly academic kind of a person. And I was doing this pretty much on my own. Wow. And so, so you were ushering in a new world of academic uh, podiatric I, medicine. Well, you know, I have to give another shout out to my uh, good friend, Larry Harkless, where I did uh, one of my rotations in my senior year with Larry at University of Texas in San Antonio when he was a first-year president. And uh, Larry really instilled that in me by saying, you know, you got to read, you got to read, you got to understand the literature, you know. And Larry happened to be one of the first persons I ever met going to CCPM. Right. You know, he, he graduated a year ahead of me. And we're very good friends. Our whole families are good friends today. But, but So I always give a shout-out to uh, Larry Harkless for that. But... That set me on my way. You know, my first two papers were published in my first year of residency because I had written them, one with Ray Locke, uh, as, a, as a student. And then my first paper on the Charcot foot was actually with a Jocelyn uh, faculty doctor, uh, George Kozak, and we, we published that in 1978. American family physician, but I should have put it in diabetes care, which that was the first year of diabetes care, but I had to follow uh, my mentor, uh, and he said to put it in uh, American family physician. So that's how things moved along. So at New England Deaconess, it's like nirvana for the diabetic foot, and yeah. your publication career really took off. I was just going to share with our listeners, you know, I was going through your CV, Bob, and in the last 46 years, there's only 10 years, 10 individual years out of 46 that you didn't have a book published, a chapter in a book published, or a peer-reviewed journal article? I didn't even know I, there was any years that I didn't have any of those. Well, the, per, your, per your CV, but, I mean, you were Maybe. So, so prolific at certain times. In 97, 98, you had 20 publications. Wow. In 2009 to 2011, you had 24 publications. So let, let's talk about that a little bit, because, you know, really, the ability to become a, a doctor to have some credibility, you have to do some research. Um, and you had some mentors already, but you started to break open some new ground there. And I will <laughs> show everybody the high-risk foot and diabetes mellitus. And yeah. I use this as a student and a resident, and I was going through it last night, and a lot of the concepts in this book are still applicable today. Yeah. Yeah. So what, how did you, as a resident and as an attending, how did you come about saying, I think there needs to be a book added to the medical literature around diabetic foot. Another interesting story. You know, I remember studying as a student, extracurricular reading, Marv Levin's book on the diabetic foot. Yeah. That kind of interested me in this regard anyway. But that was it. It was a little, almost a, ma a manual, Levin and O'Neill. The little gray one, I remember. Yeah, I don't even know if it was gray, the first one. Anyway, it was the first edition. I was using that as a study guide uh, in, in school. And, of course, I always had this interest, but uh, this book came about in about 1988, 89, when I, I went to a publisher, and I'm thinking, why did a publisher ever even listen to me? Who was I? I was a guy in Boston in private practice. And the most amazing thing is that I was able to put that together with a cast of characters that were very, very well known at the time. And the most amazing thing is they agreed to do it. I mean, you, you know, you have to realize publishing a, a chapter in a textbook doesn't get you too far. I mean, it, you could put it on your CV, but nobody, or no, I should say nobody, or rarely does anybody uh, reference a textbook chapter. It's not on PubMed. Right. The world doesn't know about it unless they happen to buy your book. So it, it's something that, you know, I felt there was a need, and I did it. Uh, it was one of my most amazing things that I've done in my career. You, you know, um, the company, we never did a follow-up to it, but, but, you know, that's fine. I think, it, as you've recognized, it's made its impact as probably the, the, it was really the second diabetic cookbook. There's many more now, as you, as you well know. But the most amazing thing is that I did this private practice. I was the editor. I put it together. I did all the editing and uh, cajoling of authors. Somehow it, it came about. So funny story. Uh, I looked at it and I signed my name and I put the date when I bought it. It was 10-3-1991. And 
I lost this book for about 10 years because I used to have the residency program and students were there and residents were there and it disappeared from my library. It was mailed to me about two weeks, two years ago. Because wow. I'd asked you many times, Bob, yeah. I need another copy. So this is uh, under lock and wow. key now. Isn't that incredible? Um, but really, you know, when I was training and I'm going through school and in residency, uh, when it came to the diabetic foot, it was your book, High Risk Foot on, in Diabetes Mellitus, and it was Dr. Warren Joseph's book on lower extremity infections that we all... T- really? I didn't realize Warren had done that one that, that, that early on. It was, yep. The, for the little red one. I was using the, what, what were the little tiny... The little tiny of the Sanford guides, yeah, oh, yes. which I, I had to use a, a magnifying glass to be able, able to read it. But, but you know, it, it was interesting back in those days. I mean, it was far easier back in the late, mid, late 80s, early 90s to keep up with everything because there wasn't a lot in the literature about diabetic foot or diabetic foot infections, you know? And so I realized, you know, it was after doing this book how little I knew and how important it was to start making note of all these authors and all these important papers and when you're giving talks. And this, you, you mentioned the evolution of podiatry. Podiatry was, more, was much more technical back, back in those days, 30, 40 years ago, and they weren't really highly academic. And doctors gave up, got up and gave talks about, I did this and I did that and it works, so just follow me. And it wasn't until I started going to non-podiatry meetings, especially my, with my friend Andrew Bolton, and we're still good friends now. He says, I, I still remember him at, at a Texas meeting saying, if, if, if it's not significant, it didn't happen, or it's rubbish or something, or something like that. So between him and Larry uh, Harkless, I started recognizing, you know, you got to pay attention to the literature. You've got to be able to cite the literature, and you've got to be able to at least cite the literature in your talks when you're giving. I mean, you know, you know that now. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but go back 30, 40 years ago, right? When you had some really big shots and good, you know, very accomplished people giving talks to our profession, but they were not academic at all, and those people would never be allowed on a stage at an international general medical meeting because, you know. No citations of literature, no citations of anything. And to, to this point, if you don't mind me no. rambling, because I think it, it really was a dichotomy in our profession, which was not academic, and I think it's gone a lot more academic now. There was a great, a great podiatrist in, in Ohio who was very, very well trained. He subsequently passed away, but he was a very, very good lecturer. Very good lecturer and very knowledgeable. But this is when I was young and I thought, you know, okay, they created a monster in me. So I said, everybody has to follow the way I I think. And he gave some very nice talks. I think it was osteomyelitis, diabetic foot osteomyelitis. And I'm not going to use his name because you probably know who I'm talking about. I said, Dr. So-and-so, I said, that was a wonderful lecture. But you, you have really uh, disappointed me. You haven't put one citation in your entire lecture. Not one citation. And we're talking 1992, 93. Not one citation. And I said, I think we deserve better than that. And I sat down. And And for five minutes, he was talking about, you know, how, well, I think people know me pretty well. And the good thing is that year or two years later, I saw him at another meeting in, in uh, New Orleans. And, and his lecture, full of citations, full of this, full of that. And I walked up to him and I said, congratulations, that was great. That's and awesome. he said, thank you. Yeah. You've mentored a lot of people. <laughs> well, we'll get into that. So, Bob, let's talk about when you were first introduced to the Charcot Foot. Hmm. What was the state of the medical knowledge about the Charcot foot? Because you've been instrumental in classifications and textbooks. And, you know, my entire career I've, has mimicked what you've done and understanding the Charcot foot. But what was it like when you first started looking at the Charcot well, foot? Well, I still remember that patient in Hackensack Hospital. I'm going to use his name for posterity, Carmen Garfoli. His Charcot foot was his good foot, you know, one he, he was hospitalized for gangrene, infection, ulceration, everything. And I still have his x-rays. People didn't know about Charcot foot. 
I mean, I, I mean, I can still remember uh, when I was a resident at the Deaconess, an orthopedist who I mentioned Charcot foot. He says, "I said shark. I said Charcot joint. I said Charcot joint. That's knee and syphilis. There's nothing. You know, what is what is that?" And, you know, it wasn't on the top of everybody's mind. Diabetic foot wasn't on the top of everybody's mind, and certainly not the charcoal foot, right? where people would misdiagnose it. You know, I still remember one of my, one of my patients when I was a resident, tragic, 21-year-old girl who was blind, legally blind, from type 1 diabetes, bilateral charcoal feet, bilateral charcoal foot. She had been to Columbia University for a workup, and they worked her up for... But oh, it has to be infection, it has to be osteomyelitis because your bone scans are positive. She was classic Charcot. And this was Columbia University Medical Center. What year? Had to be, had to be 1980, something okay. or 78, 79, probably, okay. probably closer to 79. Okay. And, and there wasn't a lot. in the literature. I mean, I, I published my first Charcot foot paper on 1978, as I said. You know, and then you, know, you might have had it in uh, Marv Levin's textbook on charcoal foot. And there were some very sem- good seminal papers, like by J.T.H. Johnson in 1967 out of Baltimore. And then you had Paul Brand uh, uh, with, with his or article 1966 on uh, the disintegration of the neuropathic foot. He was talking a lot about leprosy and that. So you had some seminal papers on it, but they weren't well known. Even in Jocelyn Clinic, Mooney Chidapa and Kozak, 1972, they had a paper on, uh, the, at that time, the largest series of 101 cases. And George Kozak, my mentor, was, was a part of that. So there wasn't a lot. If you did a literature search, you know, you, you'd be lucky to come up with uh, 20, 20 papers, m- many of which would have gone way back to uh, Charcot's Pied Tabatique, published in 1983, or Elasse's uh, cat experiments on Charcot joints, published in 1917, you know, and Steinler's paper in 1993, or excuse me, in 1933, talking about operating on Charcot feet, but they were syphilis. And it wasn't until, what, 1936, uh, uh, was it Bailey, or it was, it was Jordan, did his expose on, on neuropathic joints, uh, of the of the diabetic foot, or no, it wasn't neuropathic joints. It was just diabetic foot. It was a big expose on on a diabetic foot. Uh, Jordan Riley or something Riley Jordan, I forget his name. Um, patient number ten thousand or something wow. had a charco like angle. That was the first in diabetes that I can re- recall. Okay. Uh, and then subsequently, you know, you had more and more and more. But when I say more and more and more, a couple of papers a, a year until 66, 67, then 72. And now the literature has exploded uh, with, with uh, articles on Charcot foot. But now it's gone more to surgery, not the medical treatment, because we understand it a lot more. <laughs> William Riley Jordan. I, I was upset that I couldn't remember his name. I could see the wheels turn in there. Yeah, William Riley Jordan, 1936. I think he was out of Baltimore, too. A very, very, very uh, good paper. So I was going to go a little bit out of order, but since we're on the Charcot foot, I wanted to talk about the diabetic Charcot foot principles and management. This was published in 2010, I believe. 2010. And, you know, it's it's funny, Bob, because when I was the dean in Miami, we had a distinguished lecture series, and you came out to Miami, your publisher came with you, and I'll never forget you signing all those books for my students. It seems like it was yesterday. Uh, we might have sold 10 of them. I don't, I don't, I don't remember. Know. But I'll tell you a funny story. So you, you gave me one of these books, and I was on the airplane coming home, and I was looking at the references of one of the chapters, and I saw Jensen. And I thought, that's interesting. I don't know any other Jensen's in this space. And I realized that it was a study that was published when I was a resident at Kern Hospital by Dr. Edelman. And I was the urine guy. I was, he thought we could look at hydroxyperidinium crosslinks yeah, yeah. and differentiate osteomyelitis from Charcot. So he, unbeknownst to me, he put my name on the paper and had no idea. So anyway, I digress. So, so let's talk about this book and, and let's 
let's also talk about uh, the consensus documents. You've been, you were part of the original consensus document in 2011 for the shark foot. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the uh, ADA. Well, it was American Diabetes Association, I think, with APMA. It was, yes. So, yeah. And then did you not recently gather again in Paris to do an update to that? Yes, we just gathered in June uh, to plan on an update because, you know, it's over a decade old. So we, we had a, a meeting. Uh, we, we outlined where we were going to go, and it's not published yet. But uh, the outline is there. We're working on that. I mean, the literature has expanded so much. It's we have to focus things down and realize the American, or not the American, but the International Working Group on the Diabetic Foot for the first time put forth their guidelines on the Charcot Foot on the diagnosis of the acute Charcot Foot. So we didn't need to focus on that area so much because it was already done. Uh, Catherine Raspovich did a really good job with Jane Wukic putting all that. Uh, together. So we're going to focus more on management, surgical management of diabetic foot on our, our next, on our next update, good. which hopefully we publish, I don't know, maybe this year, but maybe next year. Very good. Um, that's interesting. You're talking about the Charcot surgical management, uh, because I know when the last consensus document came up, there wasn't a lot of research that you could use to, to support mm-hmm. different surgical techniques no i mean i mean you had people who were doing surgery you know uh, mickey pinzer god bless him he was doing doing a lot a lot and and uh Luchon and and a number of other people were operating on i mean i was operating on charcoal feet too but there weren't a lot of good uh, long-term perspective large studies so there's many many more now there's still weaknesses in the literature like which charcoal foot is best managed by surgery, which Charcot foot is best managed uh, medically or conservatively. The only thing that we recommended in our 2011 task force consensus was ankle Charcot because it very rarely can stabilize, if, if ever. I've, I've seen one or two stables, but usually you get severe dissolution of bone. Right. And so it's very unstable, hard to brace. So that was the only time we recommended primary intervention. But, but you know, primary intervention surgically is not new. If you go back to, it was a John, John Newman in, who, who did uh, uh, two papers that I remember, uh, I think 78 and 1980, like talonavicular dislocations, neuropathic dislocations, and the other paper was non-effective disease. Of, of the neuropathic foot. He recommended, you know, for, uh, for a isolated dislocation, like talonavicular is the most common one on a neuropathic foot, is primary arthrodesis. That's never going to go back together. And right. it's just going to let the foot deteriorate. And then I think Lesko and Moore did the same thing in 1988, recommended primary, primary fusion. So then, you know, we're doing more and more surgery. It's been done all along. But now there's much larger studies from very well-trained surgeons in very good hospitals like King's College Hospital. And, of course, Mickey Pinzer has done so much in Chicago. Mickey Pinzer doesn't like podiatrists for some reason, even though he's worked with them for all, all these years. He, you know, but he's done good work. Despite, despite his own personality uh, issues, I still respect all the work that he has done over the years. He really brought this... Uh, forward. So now surgery is far more acceptable for Charcot foot. The problem, as I see it, is that people, especially private in private clinics or private practices, see something like this and they start entertaining surgery when they do one or two major fusions on this a year. It's not good because these are complicated patients. So right. you, you have to have a good support system behind you a lot of experience so that you can um, handle the complications that are going to happen. I mean, complications are, are, are absolutely going to happen almost 100% of the time, but, but they could be very minor complications as well. So we've gone from, no, you can't operate on that, to, yeah, let's operate on this person and let's do a complete reconstruction, even though they have a tiny little uh, prominence on the bottom of their foot, you know, but boy, I see that x-ray, that x-ray needs to be corrected because it's not an anatomic alignment. And, and I just think it's a big problem, not just for the patients, but for the doctors. So, so the spectrum has gone, the paradigm has shifted. Um, 
And I think most of the people who have expertise in here in this regard realize if you're going to do major charcoal foot reconstructions, you really need to go to a, a center of excellence or a center where they've done a lot and have a lot of good experience because of the nature of the problem, the nature of the patient, which is a, a very complicated, high-risk patient. So it's just a big paradigm shift that I've seen over the years, but we need more studies to indicate, okay, which patient is best served by surgery, which patient is not. I remember putting that forth in a research protocol when I was back in Boston. Right. We need to know conservative versus surgical. Who can we predict is going to do good just with conservative, with footwear, and who do we predict needs surgery for long-term limb salvage? Be a wonderful study and worthy of an NIH-funded <laughs> grant for sure. Uh, well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you, Bob, I'm really looking forward to that new consensus document coming out. I think it'll help everybody. You know, as we were talking, um, I remember you, you, weren't you the president of the American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons at one point? Yeah, back 2000, I think it was 2002, 2003. Yeah. You know, I would propose that in order to be a good wound care doctor, diabetic foot care doctor, you've got to be a good surgeon too. Well, you, you, you have to take that with a grain of salt, or at least you have to work with a good surgeon. This has become very evident now, too. If you look at the International Working Group guidelines going from the late 90s to currently, 2003, they're all recommending the, they're all recognizing the important role of surgery in managing the diabetic foot. Yeah. But remember, most, most of the people managing diabetic foot around the world are not surgeons. They are internists, maybe infectious disease doctors, maybe diabetologists who happen, are the only ones who can manage it. Yeah. And they're big challenge is finding a surgeon who will work with them not to remove a leg but to save a leg so it's much more recognized now that you any diabetic foot team needs to have a surgeon maybe a vascular surgeon or a vascular endovascular specialist but also a surgeon who can handle the infections who can handle the necessary amputations the drainages the this and the that well, that's interesting because not only around the world is that an issue, that's an issue here in the United States at wound care centers. It, Same thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's become a big business though, Jeff. You know, how many people are really dedicated? I mean, really dedicated to the science, really dedicated to the academics surrounding this. I mean, I, I fell into wound care because I've been involved in diabetic foot for 40, whatever it is. I don't even like to think how many years. And it was always that. Yeah. But... You know, things have changed. You know, I think as a profession, Bob, we appreciate the academic rigor that you've put forth into the diabetic foot. And uh, to this day, to this day, I've never seen anybody quote articles like you across the board <laughs> on any topic. I just think it's the greatest. I'm not like I used to be. You know, I used to be tough, and but but uh, I've slowed down a little bit. But I can still remember some of them. Yeah, you know, that's great. You know, you spent almost 15 years at the VA yeah, in Phoenix. Yeah, 15 uh, years chief, at this VA. Chief of the podiatry section and residency director. Mm -hmm. uh, so what was it like training residents over the years? What was the transition? Well, you know, I started training residents back in Boston, you know, at the Deaconess. I was always part of that faculty. And then we, there was another small osteopathic medical center in Boston. I was the chief there, too, and the head of the residency program. And uh, it's a blessing. Really, I mean, you have good residents, you have bad residents, you have good students, you have not such, such good students. But I think being at the VA, you know, uh, with all of its restrictions and difficulties and bureaucracy was really good because you had very sick patients who were very appreciative of what we did, who really needed the help. And God bless them. My, my residents, when, when they were there... Um, I don't know. If we, were you a dean when I was when I was still there? I was, the, but I was in Miami. You were in Miami, right. but and we took some of your students too. Yep. As residents, uh, the experience that they got was just unbelievable in terms of wound care, complexity of you know trauma, fractures, and infections, com complex medical issues, uh, Charcot foot, diabetic foot ulcers, everything. It was it was just wonderful, you know. So. When, when my residents graduated after three years, they could, they could hold their heads up high against anybody anywhere in the world on how to manage diabetic foot because my residents were in the trenches all the time. 
and they'd see the patients when they first came in, they'd follow them up after their surgery, follow up all their complications, and then follow them up for their next complications down the road. So it was very, very rewarding. I can only imagine. I mean, uh, I don't think there's anything more rewarding than training residents. I I did it for many years too, and so proud of them. It's almost like your kids after a while. So, uh, So Bob, currently, well, what are you doing these days? You're consulting, you're working in the Middle East a little bit. Yeah, oh, well, we had a, we were setting up a diabetic foot clinic in Dubai in 2019 until the pandemic hit mm-hmm. and then everything shut down and we were, <laughs> our, the owner of our company and our clinic said, you better get out of there today mm-hmm. or you're not getting back because wow. they, they shut everything down. So we got out, we got the notice eight in the morning and 2 a.m. we were on a flight to London. Wow. So that didn't work out, unfortunately. And we were having trouble getting referrals. It was a difficult insurance situation. So, so now I'm consulting with a lot of companies on uh, research, wound care products, mobile wound care. I think I told you. Yeah. Mobile wound care is where the paradigm shift is going. And it blossomed in the pandemic because people didn't want to go into clinics or the clinics were shut down. So the mobile wound care groups went to the nursing homes and they went to the patients' homes and they have expanded unbelievably. I don't know where they came from, but now you see, you see these independent, privately owned mobile wound care uh, groups, some owned by podiatrists, some owned by PAs, have tens of thousands of wounds under their care at any one time. Now, there's no wound center that has tens of thousands of wounds under their care at any one time. I mean, this is really incredible. And we're not talking, diabetic foot ulcers are the least in terms of frequency. It's mainly, then it's mainly pressure ulcers, the one type of chronic wound that needs to be studied more, Mm -hmm. which is understudied. We have the opportunity to do that now. And then you also have VLUs. So, you know, I've been involved in, in this area for a long time. As you know, I've done research papers. I did research before. I've been doing a lot with topical oxygen, which, thank the Lord, the evidence is there now so that nobody can deny the efficacy of topical oxygen based on multiple international systematic reviews with meta-analyses, good, robust clinical trials, real world evidence it cannot be done and even the ada in the most recent standards of care that they publish every january indicated the very last thing that topical oxygen among like placental membranes and and negative pressure therapy received an a level rating because of the quality and the international working group finally recognized the role also for topical oxygen you've been very instrumental for years in that regard what what a shift from 15 years ago oh yeah Incredible. Wow. And I was one of the naysayers 15, 20 years ago. Wow. All right. Well, Bob, I, I think we could talk forever here. Um, maybe we're just going to need to get you back on the show because I've got, I, I started with like three pages of questions <laughs> and we only got through one. But uh, I want to pr- tell you, I appreciate you taking the time to drive down here. We're in Arizona. It's hotter than blazes this oh, time it of is. year. It is. And you're wearing a sport coat. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, the air condition's pretty good. I won't wear this outside, though. No. But, Bob, on behalf of everybody in the profession, I thank you for your, your career contributions to our profession. Um, it's unbelievable, actually, how much you've given to our profession. And um, your energy and your passion and your enthusiasm is, has always been a uh, driving force for me in my career, too. I consider you a mentor. Oh, thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Just what I did. That's all. No, it's incredible. Um, so, Bob, it, when we end our, our shows, I always say cheers with the Dean's Chat Cup. So I'm going to give you one of these Ooh, cups. I know you, you like to drink coffee, so yeah. you'll get one of those. And uh, I wanted to thank all of our listeners uh, for being here today. Uh, it's just a, just a phenomenal episode with Dr. Freiberg. Uh, we appreciate it. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, uh, we'd appreciate a five-star rating. And if you're on YouTube, by all means, become a subscriber. And we will continue to bring you the leaders in podiatric medicine. And until next week... Cheers.